History is like a flowing body of water. It leads us, gives us direction, it shapes us, defines us as who we are and what we believe in and where we want to be. With change comes challenges, a city yearning to grow beyond the limits of its birthplace, never forgetting the struggles of generations past, yet at the same time forming new ideas, new solutions, new dreams for future generations. No single person can make all the difference. It takes all of us, together, with the guidance of our elected leaders of this great city we call home, San Antonio. We have seen champions of all calibers through three centuries. We have witnessed visionaries in motion, striving to make San Antonio competitive now and in the future. We have seen hard times but lived through them, at times fearful of the future, unsure of what lies ahead. San Antonians stick together. When it seems like the world around us is falling apart, in victory or death, we stand by and defend each other. And as we move forward into our fourth century as a city together, we must never forget where this great city started, the flow of a body of water centuries ago. always remember that it is a priceless asset, this San Antonio River, because it reflects the entire course of the history of our people and of our state. When I think of San Antonio, I think of color. I think of warmth, music, laughter and uh, food and just sensation. I think about just how friendly this city is. I think San Antonio is a fundamentally different place than it was. The wonderful culture and history of San Antonio, the diversity of peoples. I think of the city that I love and that I came to love when I moved here. A city that has undergone major changes but yet has not achieved its true potential. A big heart that people really care about one another. As a city, it's, it continues to amaze me at how it continues to keep the charm that it had even when I remember as a, a young kid enjoying San Antonio, it's still here today. Beauty, Mexican food. <laughs> when I hear San Antonio, I think of love. I didn't realize what a gem we lived in. So when I'm a little kid, San Antonio to me represented the big city. Just a feel you get. It's such a big town, but it still has that family feel about it. The one thing about San Antonio I like, it's, it's everybody's a, it's just a big neighborhood. From sleepy manana to, to bustling city of the future. It was here, San Antonio, the Alamo, the shape of that church. It was just something I used to go and play in the garden with my soldiers. first person that began um, some kind of a permanent settlement here was a, a priest, a Franciscan priest. And of course followed by the Spanish soldiers, which was the Presidio, and then followed by the Canary Islanders who were sent over by the King of Spain. Um, and so um, really it, found, it was founded right, uh, you know, at San Fernando. That was considered the center of the city with the plaza and the church as one entity. So the first mission was what we now call the Alamo, and it was uh, founded actually in another part of downtown close to where Santa Rosa Hospital is right now. Uh, and then it was ultimately moved to the location that it is currently uh, at. And the other missions came within a few years. For example, 1718 was the Alamo. It was called San Antonio de Valero. 1720 was San Jose and then 1731 was the, were the other three missions that would be Concepcion, San Juan, and Espada. But the missions were founded as um, missionary communities for the Native Americans. In other words, they, would go, they were gonna be led by the missionaries, the Franciscans, but they were going to be like small villages of Native Americans. 
the Canary Islanders came to San Fernando and began the, the civic settlement and ultimately both the, uh, the indigenous settlements, meaning the Indian settlements and the civic settlement merged together um, probably sometime after the 1790s up into the early 1800s where the missions were closed as missions but then the communities around them got the lands and continued to, uh, to grow and thrive and then the city of San Antonio kind of began to take shape as a city. You know, when Davy Crockett came here, he crossed the Sabine River into Texas. He wrote back to his family. He wasn't a big writer and didn't keep in touch that much when he would go off, you know, somewhere. He wrote back to his family just absolutely exclaiming how, how beautiful Texas was. It was like, he almost just described it like Garden of Eden terms, you know. You stop to think about what took place here in this, this hallowed ground. You know, all the things that, that happened and as we now are connected more with history. We're going through a tremendous, uh, um, well, we're having a very serious conversation about the history of the Alamo because it doesn't all mean the same thing that we were taught when we were younger. Uh, and it was totally glamorized and legends were made and such. But I don't think the real story of how that all came about who was behind, you know, the walls of the Alamo protecting uh, what was a move for independence and such. In the history of immigrants coming to this land that was owned by Mexico and given certain rights, but then they had greater ambitions and decided they didn't want to be limited and, and took matters into their own hands. Because you had Mexican citizens that lived here that felt exploited and oppressed by the Mexican government. If you take a look at the buildings up until 1968, all the buildings backed up to the river. None of them had river entrances. What people come to see more than just about anything else was nothing but garbage. That was the back of all of the businesses. But somebody had a vision to do something about that. And now look at our beautiful river walk. Blackman is home to the 59th Medical Wing and the 37th Training Wing, which graduates nearly 80,000 young men and women from Air Force Basic, Technical, Security, and International Training every year. Well, to talk about Lackland Air Force Base, I have to talk about the man, Frank, Frank Lackland. He was in charge of the former Kelly Air Force Base in the 30s, in the late 30s, and it was his idea to come out with another piece of land to train aviation cadets. He didn't want to do it on Kelly Field, so he looked at land west, southwest of Kelly, went over Leon Creek and found this area that he could use. Now, it was ideal mainly because the government already owned it, because we were using a lot of this land for a bombing range for pilots that were flying out of Kelly. So they were flying out of Kelly, flying over Leon Creek, and dropping their practice bombs around. And occasionally we find one from time to time. There was a lot going on in the world. Um, Hitler had already gone into the Soviet Union. Uh, every, Europe was on fire for the most part. And if you remember in 1941, in December, Pearl Harbor. So there was a lot happening and we were ready to get into the war anyway, I'm sure. So in June of 41 is when we started sending young men over here to learn how to become aviation cadets. When you look at all of JBSA, Joint Base San Antonio, we're talking about four installations. We have Lackland, we have Fort Sam Houston, we have Randolph Air Force Base, and we have Camp Bullis in the northwest part of town. Now together, the economic impact for the city is somewhere around $50 billion. We've had some notable people that have come through here. Sunny Anderson, for one, she's popular on the Food Network channel. Uh, she was part of the Air Force, Art, Air Force Entertainment Troop, but she was an excellent cook. So when she got out of the Air Force, that was her claim to fame. Uh, of course, Johnny Cash went through. Don't think he was happy about coming through at the time, but uh, he went through and spent time here during basic training. Willie Nelson came through here for Air Force basic training. Uh, George Bush Jr. came through here for basic training as well, which, you know, politics aside, he's the only one to have ever gone from Airman Basic to Commander in Chief. This is an incredible base. I have the honor of being the historian here, and uh, I have a chance to talk to veterans every day, literally every day of the week. Uh, in person, they come into my office, 
they remember this place. Uh, basic training has a huge impact on an individual. And it's basic training across the board, but specifically with the Air Force. Um, they may forget any number of things. They may forget their spouse's birthday, but they never forget their military training instructor. I don't care how many years back you go. And they can come onto this base and they can tell you where they were when they got in trouble or where they, how they marched to the chow hall. It's wonderful. And I really love engaging with the vets that come through here. Meet me at the fair. Meet me at the fair, San Antonio's hemisphere will open on the 15th of April, 1968, right in the middle of town. Look south from Justice. Look east from the Tower Life Building. Look west from Victoria Plaza. Hundreds of buildings will come down, of course. Dozens of others, the oldest and the best, will be retained for use as exhibition halls and offices and meeting places. Here in San Antonio, the permanent buildings involved with the hemisphere will include that convention center, which San Antonio voters have been asked to decide on in the bond election of January 28th. Long needed by the city, the convention center is also of vital importance to the hemisphere and will form a focal point from which it can expand. Set south of Market Street and east of Alamo, the convention center will contain conference rooms and dining facilities and exhibition space. 40, about 41 years ago, I received a call from Congressman Henry B. Gonzalez. And he said that he wanted to, he had just been elected to the Congress of the United States. And he wanted to do something for San Antonio, and he called it a 20th District Fair. If you picked one event uh, that was truly instrumental in San Antonio taken off on a totally different trajectory as far as its economy, uh, and once you do that, it has tremendous social uh, implications, political implications, definitely the economic uh, implications and that would have to be Hemisphere. In 1968, uh, we lived through one of the most tumultuous years in American history. Between the Vietnam War and the war protests and President Johnson stepping down and then Dr. King being assassinated in April and then Bobby Kennedy being assassinated in June and then the cities burning all over America. San Antonio decided in the 1960s to start thinking big and start thinking beyond its borders. So San Antonio began to realize that if it was going to grow and develop, it had to do something. So we began planning. And with that planning in the 50s came two of the most incredible economic generators that we're living off of today. Not only were we going to introduce San Antonio to the world, hopefully we might learn a little bit about, more about the world ourselves through this, and I think we sure did. There was the Hilton Hotel that had to be built, we had to have a hotel. And it, it was a very fast track operation. And then once the, it started, then suddenly everybody realized, well, a hotel has to have parking. And so then there had to be a parking structure built. The uh, Hilton Palacio del Rio was great to watch because they built the rooms first, then they put a crane and then they put a tail of like a helicopter engine on it to help guide it and they would lift it up and stack it like blocks. And that was fun to watch. We'd sometimes just go downtown and watch, watch them work on the hotel just for the fun of it. This is where the fair settled, on 92 acres in downtown San Antonio. The land was bought with $12.5 million in federal urban renewal funds. It will remind San Antonians that they, that they built the hemisphere. It will remind them of the kind of courage and the kind of ambition and uh, and the kind of sheer determination to do something beyond what they had ever accomplished before. One was the tower, which I was the project architect and uh, the designer, and uh, the other was the RCA pavilion. There were four different designs that we did. It was an interesting design, but it, had, it didn't have a program. In other words, it wasn't done in response to a, a, a particular idea of how it would operate, then the fourth design emerged, and that's the tower that was built. You can't design 
a reinforced concrete structure without knowing what the overturning moment is going to be of the, of the building shape itself. This is the actual uh, piece uh, of material. This and this is the patterning of the this is the patterning of the tower itself with the elevator shafts shown around. Uh, uh, this is the actual one that we put in the water. In order to have hemisphere, an older neighborhood had to be obliterated, really. And for many of those families to be told that the family uh, home, which, you know, maybe you had grown up in and which your family had lived in for 40 years or 50 years or something, you know, was now going to be demolished or was going to be made into something as part of the fair. That, that was hard. Because this is a real thing. This is a world's fair. Set along the great Pan-American Highway, which links the two continents, whose story it tells, Hemisphere is this country's first downtown fair, easily accessible to all. Take a water taxi and ride into the heart of the city's new $10 million civic center, a three-building complex consisting of a theater, an exhibit hall, and an arena, clustered about a river court. And the international flavor of the entertainment is matched by more than 60 restaurants and food stands which offer visitors delicacies from around the globe. How do you get to Hemisphere? It couldn't be easier. Find your way to the 15th largest city in the United States and then look up. The 622-foot tower of the Americas serves the fair as center and theme structure. Hemisphere, man, that was crazy. April 6th, 1968, I was six years old, and I still remember looking up at the tower and wanting to go in. A lot of people don't remember this, but it wasn't open on opening day. But I think it really changed the character of San Antonio as far as what constituted economic drivers. And it attracted people that probably would have never come to San Antonio, hadn't heard of San Antonio. Plus, we had infrastructure improvements that would be lasting and really plussed up our ability to accommodate maybe other economic interests. Uh, our tourism really took off at that point because of the improvements that had been made and the many new eyes uh, that were brought to San Antonio and people said, wow, this is a tremendous place and an opportunity. Oh, the World's Fair was just an incredible you know, godsend to San Antonio. Uh, it literally gave us not only a, an incredible uh, landscape, but it also brought so many people here who may not have really even known about San Antonio. Not only did I attend it, I'm showing my age, I worked there. And it was my all-time favorite job in my whole life. I was a hostess for the Lagoon Cruise. The whole world congregated here in that one little space there downtown. But it's because of Hemisphere, I knew that there was something more to it. And when I saw the Tower of the Americas as I flew in, I went, oh, this is a cool city. If you think about it, Hemisphere played all the roles that a fair ought to play. It was entertaining, it was colorful, it was a view of the future, but it was also an opportunity for a city to show itself off. And in San Antonio's case, one more dimension, which was create the platform for the future growth that would come. At the end of the day, the thing that would make the biggest difference was our some 25 to 28 uh, sponsors that had uh, exhibits in buildings that they had built here on the fairgrounds. Those exhibits were really into the future and not into the past. To walk through Hemisphere, we literally were seeing things we had never seen before and, and never could have imagined. And that, to me, was a turning point for San Antonio. We were the little sleepy village by the river. I think the fair, in, a, in a, both a concrete and an, and an abstract way, showed us that we could, we could make a major transformation 
we could, we could change things up and that people could really be excited about it. It's indelibly in the minds and hearts of everyone who was alive in San Antonio at that time. That was the only weekend that I didn't work. I worked every weekend of the six months. In fact, the monorail fell right by where I was working. San Antonio became a kind of a incubator for the Latino versions of the civil rights movement. So the fair, hemisphere, created a kind of a moment of coming together and consensus and maybe a look at what the future might be. Welcome to a day at the fair, Hemisphere 68. KLRN's half hour of fun and fair. And now here's your host, Bill Maul. Thank you very much. Nice to have you with us on our day at the fair. are the most exciting 92 acres in America. When fully rigged, four flyers descend from the top secured only by ropes about their waists as they make circular revolutions about the pole. Climbing to the top is only half the fun, says the chief, who dances precariously atop a 12-inch disc while playing a reed flute and a small drum. The girls at Hemisphere in San Antonio are observing Secretary's Week with more fascinating lunch and coffee breaks than their compatriots. Sights like the circular U.S. pavilion tempt them, but office business comes first as the girls keep up with the mass of correspondence at this official World's Fair. Everything's up to date at the fair, from the unusual moving graphic displays at the German pavilion to the latest advances in electronic equipment. There's less work for the secretary as IBM's magnetic tape selectric typewriter automatically types error-free copy at speeds of up to 150 words per minute. It's called Hemisphere 68. Join the party. After Hemisphere was over, everyone was sort of exhausted. <laughs> the, uh, the city's efforts had been stretched to the limits. That was true for the business community. And so after the Hemisphere was over, they were still trying to handle the residual debts that had to be cleared up. It went through the, into the 70s. It went into like the 70s and 80s where there was a kind of a decline um, in, the, in the property there. Recently, City Council got a sneak preview of Hemisphere's new look. And on April 6th, the public is invited to the dedication of downtown's latest development. Dominating the city's skyline as it has for two decades, Hemisphere is a symbol of San Antonio, even if its role has sometimes been in question. Now, on April 6th, 20 years to the day after the first opening of Hemisphere, the city will once again be celebrating, but this time, the rebirth of an idea. And where that idea will be 20 years from now is hard to say, except that most certainly Hemisphere will be at the very heart of San Antonio. And then, the seeds were planted, I think, at the 25th anniversary in 93 to try to start doing things. And then suddenly everybody got a second wind, you might say, and then we started moving forward in a very nice way. The 50 years since have been a pretty consistent story of uh, San Antonio finding, you know, its identity. And that identity is different from other cities. Uh, because it's less about some great economic breakthrough and more about uh, a style of governance, a style of collaboration, a style of dialogue where people actually respect each other and create a new culture. Light camera action, San Antonio. The city of the future. That's what they said back in the 90s. Well, I got news for you. The future's here. And that tower is an antique now.
loud and clear. found that Texas cities are having troubles as well. One example is the daily jam up on parts of IH-10 in San Antonio. We have a uh, two uh, lane situation uh, which it has to take the volume of three and four lanes and uh, we've created a very severe bottleneck uh, here just on the outskirts of the central business district of San Antonio. Well, our city planning department has already proposed widening IH-10 at this location, uh, but the fact of the matter is that the funds uh, which would be necessary for highway department participation uh, simply don't exist. We've seen at least four victims taken to these EMS units right here. Shots fired, shots fired. We have some co uh, police officers down. Well, the judge would murder. I worked that. San Antonians and those who visit the downtown area in the future will be enjoying what is being described as a beautiful flowing water fountain costing $250,000. Waterfall is being donated by a prominent local family. In the past year, San Antonio has thrust itself into a race toward the 21st century. After decades of being known as a quiet stepchild to cities like Houston and Dallas, San Antonio is now ready to take its place as one of the nation's major urban centers. This March, the New York Times ran an article highlighting San Antonio's increasing success in attracting high-tech industry. There are about 840,000 people living within the city limits and well over one million in the metropolitan area. That makes San Antonio the nation's 11th largest city. Target 90, the program to put San Antonio in control of its future. Billed as a grassroots planning effort, Target 90 is an ambitious attempt to involve every sector of the city in the earliest stages of planning. I have a great fear that no matter how successful we might be in the short run, um, we're not going to have created uh, a stake among the people of San Antonio that the momentum we're creating today ought to be carried over into the future. Now, what's the field of corporate medical research and manufacturing hold for the future. Diagnostic machinery, CAT scanners, nuclear scanners, the so-called bioengineering, which is human parts, that is to say, artificial limbs and arms and joints and pancreas, all kinds of medically related equipment, toxic monitors and instruments. Uh, the field is going to be one of the fastest growing in the American industrial economy. The biosciences is a terribly exciting area. Well, we've got 160,000 jobs today in the biomedical sciences. I didn't do that. Uh, the people who envisioned the medical center contributed to that. The people who built the University of Texas Health Science Center envisioned that. The people who built companies like KCI, the people who uh, expanded and built up uh, Southwest Foundation for Biomedical Research, now called Biomed SA. There's a lot, a lot of players and a lot of institutions. But what I did try to do was explain to people this is an organizing principle, right? Uh, let's not do these things in silos, separately. Let's figure out how we make two plus two equal five. Earlier today, the company denied it, but now the news has been confirmed. More than 200 employees of the San Antonio-based Data Point Corporation have been laid off their jobs today. In the news, a 13-year-old murder mystery has come to life again as friends of Jennifer Delgado gathered to remember a life cut short. On June 6, 1988, Jennifer was helping her mother wash clothes at a laundromat near their home. They told police a man walked in to buy a soda. When the machine didn't produce a can, he got angry, pulled out a knife, and stabbed Jennifer and her mother in the stomach. Uh, one of the pictures I have of the queen is the queen and I are sitting at the front of one of our river cruisers and cruising down the river. And that's always kind of the thing that we do with visitors. We do it with the Prince of Wales, we do it with whoever comes. And um, we had the king and queen of 
like Spain. We've had so many wonderful visitors at, at different times, and we always show off our river. Visits by Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Charles. I'll, re I'll never forget when Queen Elizabeth was riding on a barge, and there I was at the Arneson River Theater uh, covering her visit, and then we had lunch at the convention center, and Prince Charles, and it, it was just a very exciting time. San Antonio Crackdown. Your hosts for this evening's special broadcast from KENS-TV, Chris Maru. From KMOL-TV, Deborah Daniels. And from KSAT-TV, Bob Salter. And reporting live from the Crackdown Helpline Telephone Bank, Kathleen O'Connor from KABB-TV. And also joining us live from the Crackdown Tip Line Telephone Bank from KWEX-TV, Victor Landa and KVDA, Patricio Espinoza. Good evening. It was not by accident that we chose this mock courtroom as a setting for San Antonio crackdown. You see, in courtrooms, both state and federal, scattered throughout our viewing area, drug cases are clogging the dockets. Our criminal justice system is being stretched to its very limit in fighting the war on drugs. Our law enforcement officers in courts need your help. The fact that seven of the eight San Antonio television stations have put competition aside tonight to air this program together is positive proof there is no exclusive in this horrible story. At home, we can often ignore the problems of the world, but when you're called to sit on a jury, you have no choice. You're forced to listen to the facts and then forced to make a decision. Tonight, we're asking you to sit in this jury box and to reach your own verdict. And we hope that verdict will be that you must join in this fight against illegal drugs. The police and courts can't win the war alone. Heidi Seaman and Erica Boteo. Heidi disappeared on August 4th as she was walking home from a friend's house. Hundreds came out to help search. A few weeks later, she was found murdered in a field. Fortunately, no one was hurt when a huge section of the exterior wall of Hemisphere Arena collapsed this morning. The concrete section was 20 by 40 feet and fell onto a pathway on the east side of the building. Eyewitness News. They came out by the thousands, waving signs, wearing T-shirts, hoping and praying to save their jobs, their families, their paychecks to save our base. Now those 4,000 acres on San Antonio's west side, the area that supported thousands of families through births, college, marriage, the place called Kelly Air Force Base will soon no longer exist. The base that's trained and supported American troops through every major war and conflict in the last 80 years will be history itself. Good evening. While we're not at war, Kelly Air Force Base took a direct hit today. In Washington tonight, one of the most prominent members of the original Clinton cabinet, one of the best-known Hispanic politicians in the country, faces very serious charges. Henry Cisneros, the former mayor of San Antonio and former secretary of housing. Chris, rather than pages, the indictment might be better measured in pounds. I'm saying that I'm a human being in addition to being mayor. And I'm saying that I'm not perfect. Live, local, late breaking. KSAT 12 News at 5 begins right now. A possible break in the case of this missing San Antonio mother. Good afternoon, I'm Ursula Perry. And I'm Jeff Brady. The search for Patty Vaughn taking on yet another mysterious twist. Deborah, if a city can have an economic complexion, San Antonio's is more than just a little bruise today. The Arena Vote. A WB35 News Election Special. If somebody says tourists won't come here, ask this. Would you turn down a vacation in a vibrant, beautiful city because it had a new arena? It's a fart. And I think unless the Spurs can come up with a fair idea, a fair plan where the community actually does benefit, well, then we should vote no on November 2nd. The battle lines have been drawn for weeks. Tomorrow, you decide if San Antonio needs a new arena. Good evening, I'm Jody Manley. This is a special report from Fox 29 at WB35. I'm Jim Marsh of Fox 29 and WB35 with an update on that hazardous material truck accident and that major hydrochloric acid spill that's causing that incredible mess downtown. Good afternoon, I'm Chris Maru. And I'm Sarah Lucetta. We begin with some late-breaking news concerning what Chris just mentioned. Former South Texas Congressman Henry B. Gonzalez was undergoing tests at a local hospital today. He was admitted this morning after uh, he was complaining that he wasn't feeling well. 
While the 84-year-old was taken to Baptist Medical Center as a precaution, we were told he hadn't yet been admitted. They were still running tests. But just minutes ago, we got word that former Congressman Henry B. Gonzalez has died. And Dad worked so hard his entire life, and uh, he dedicated himself to the welfare and well-being of San Antonio. But the things that he accomplished have had lasting effects on San Antonio. This is News 4 WOAI. The wait is almost over. Just 30 more minutes until the SBC Center opens on San Antonio's east side. They are expecting a big crowd tonight. We begin with breaking news. It's official. Toyota chooses San Antonio for the site of its next U.S. plant. But I've seen, you know, physical growth. I've seen cultural growth. An incredible explosion in the arts. I mean, it, literally, the shape is changing right now with the new Frost Bank Tower going up. That's another thing that I think is so special about San Antonio. We don't discard of things lightly. We really love our history and we value it so much that we want to build our city around our history. Look at the Pearl, for example. We didn't knock it down and build state-of-the-art. We did build state-of-the-art restaurants and great places to, to sit around and, and enjoy, but we did it in the compass. Like, we encompassed all that San Antonio had way back when it was the Pearl Brewery and we made it part of today. San Antonio decided, hey, you know what? It's time to go full force and we're not looking back. And that's what they did. And all of a sudden we have these fantastic restaurants and state of the art. It's like, look at the Henry B. Gonzalez Convention Center. We have Southtown. We have, it's become trendy. And that's kind of cool. The new Frost Bank building going up. We're getting a skyline, which Fred, Fred always complained about our ugly, boring skyline. If he only knew. We have had some very, very special people who have done so much to conserve, to preserve, to renovate some of our historic buildings. More layers to San Antonio, like the Pearl and the extension on the River Walk and, and the revitalization of downtown and, the, and all the, the tech things that are happening here that make us a really vibrant city. You got the flood from the 20s, uh, 1920, 21. You, you can still go see the watermarks. They're on the building. And they're up there near 35, 36 feet, so that means most of downtown San Antonio was underwater. And the answer to that was to build the Almost Dam. We interrupt this program for a live weather update. Good afternoon. We're going to bring you an update on the weather activity that's going on into Texas. First of all, we'll show you our satellite picture. Lots of activity occurring from West Texas, some heavier snowfall, of course, right into the San Antonio area. We are really socked in tight. There's lots of moisture continuing to move in from the Pacific. And of course, with that cold air still moving in from the north, that's really bringing us some record snowfall. Well, the 85 snow was very cool, working back at our friends up the hill during that time. And I remember looking at all the charts and walking in uh, to the assignment editor at that time was Frank Guerra. And I told Frank, Frank, it's going to snow. And he just laughed at me. And I said, no, Frank, it's really going to snow. And he says, OK. And I said, Frank, it's going to snow like you've never seen snow before. And he looked at me and says, OK, all right. There's the wide band of just light, light colored activity. Now, this is all snow stretching all the way back from Rock Springs, right over Hondo and San Antonio. I remember going up on top of that building and looking out. And on uh, 410, you could see people snow skiing. Of course, uh, we're not uh, familiar with this kind of weather for long stretches of time. I just uh, issued a declaration uh, in cooperation with the city police department and the Department of uh, Public Safety of the state uh, asking people to refrain from unnecessary travel on the city streets. Here's Gilbert sitting right smack dab in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, the cloud shield just to the southeast of the San Antonio area. Down closer to La Pesca, Mexico. And that's a good part. It never made that northwest turn we were looking at. This is a tornado warning issued by the National Weather Service Forecast Office in San Antonio. Gilbert was interesting. Category 5 hurricane. Biggest thing that's been out there in the Gulf since Harvey. Uh, it uh, spun up four tornadoes that ended up coming right through San Antonio, one of the big armbands. One of them went right across uh, Lackland, and when the uh, area of Kelly split a hangar there in half. This is a special report from the 9 o'clock news on Fox 29. 
I want to bring you up to date on our developing weather situation, what has continued to be now a, an even more deadly situation before we have lost our sixth life to this flooding. Emergency conditions across much of Texas as flooding brings death and destruction. The San Antonio area was hardest hit. I never thought anything like this could be this bad. This is NBC Nightly News, reported by Soledad O'Brien. Good evening. We begin tonight in Texas, where heavy rainstorms have triggered deadly floods over a 200-mile area from San Antonio to Houston. At least 10 people are dead. Thousands have been forced from their homes. National Guard troops are helping with rescues. And forecasters tracking the storm say this saturated area will get still more rain. It is the worst flood in San Antonio history. More than a foot of rain in little more than 36 hours, up to two feet in some places. We'll make it through it. We'll rebuild and we'll start all over. This is just a temporary setback. That's all it is. But all the water that fell here yesterday is moving down the rivers toward the Gulf of Mexico, threatening homes and forcing evacuations all the way to Houston, 200 miles away. Jim Cummins, NBC News, San Antonio. If you're just tuning in and joining us, the reason we are still on the air is because this is one of the, if not the worst, flooding events in San Antonio history. As much as 10, 12, 15 inches of rain reported uh, in this area. Outside of Alamo Stadium where you would not believe the water that is rushing towards the stadium from the exit off Hildebrand, the lightning and the rain, as you know, well, they were going to play this football game anyway, but because of the lightning and this deluge that we've gotten in just the last 30 minutes to an hour has canceled not only the Burbank-Edison game this afternoon, but also the Jefferson and Bright game this evening. Alamo Stadium is just about underwater. The rain is uh, just as much as I've ever seen it in my, what, 35 years of living in San Antonio. Things are a little dark in the studio right now. It may look a little odd to you. I'm not sure how it's going to come across on your screen, but we've lost some of our lights uh, in the studio. Fortunately, we have plenty of pictures to show you what's going on outside. Ah, there, there we they go. come. Uh, the Don, are back wow. Wow. Don Harris will join us and the lights came back on. We are going to take you now back to regular programming, but again, we will be here and bringing you coverage as necessary, as warranted throughout the morning. This has been a News 4 San Antonio weather advisory. In 98, we had that massive flood. Uh, I remember they were in the studio here. I was talking with the emergency folks. Uh, we were talking about Medina Dam going away. And that was really close because it was within six inches of overtopping that dam. And had that dam given way, uh, the people downstream would have only had minutes to react. Not even, they wouldn't have had enough time to get out of the way. That's how serious that was. It has been a shootout from the start, one of the toughest political showdowns San Antonio has ever seen. The duel over the dome, a verbal gunfight that has many voters wondering which side is wearing the black hats. Some have been searching for help from above. It's a holy war. It's the forces of right versus wrong. Others have been more down to earth. The people behind the dome, they read like who's who from the north side of the city of San Antonio. And tonight the showdown continues with a verbal shootout between Mayor Henry Cisneros and Councilwoman Helen Dutmer. Tonight we are going to examine one of the most important and most complex issues ever to face San Antonio voters. Whether to add a half cent to the city's sales tax to finance the construction of a stadium. The relative cost advantage of using the sales tax is such that because over five years the stadium is paid out completely, pay-as-you-go financing, it costs $174 million against any other approach that would require 435. And in the middle of all the madness came a musical message sending everyone over the edge.
at 12 News at 6. It started as a vision to brighten San Antonio's future. The transformation from the drawing board to reality is complete. Already, the Alamo Dome has weathered public criticism, rainstorms that delayed construction, and now it's ready to welcome the public. Good evening, I'm Bob Salter. And I'm Karen Gallagher, live from the Alamo Dome. Thanks for joining us this evening. In just 17 hours, thousands of people will pack the dome for the great grand opening tomorrow. Everything is far from ready, though. Workers are working around the clock, installing lights, laying bricks, fixing walkways, sweeping, and landscaping. That's just at the dome itself. The Via Bus Terminal is also undergoing final touches. The actual celebration tomorrow will take quite a bit of work to pull off. It'll feature a bit of everything. There will be ice skaters, gymnasts, basketball players, and hockey players all doing demonstrations. Then there are the singers, the bands, laser shows, fireworks, hot air balloons, even a scheduled flyover of the dome by a squadron of jets, Bob. Eyewitness News, San Antonio's top-rated satellite newscast. Ten years and $186 million after it was proposed, the Alamo Dome is opening up to the residents of San Antonio and South Texas. Tomorrow, thousands will be heading downtown for a look at what many call the dome that Henry built. Good evening, I'm Fred Lozano. And I'm Deborah Naponia. The Alamo Dome's grand opening is now just a little over 14 hours away. And, you know, a lot of people say it's Henry's Hacienda, and I guess you can call it that. 25 years from today, the Alamo Dome, Bob, won't be so sparkling and brand new, but the memories of opening day will still be very bright for all of us. That's because in 25 years, they'll open up the time capsule buried outside the dome today. The brightly colored case contains items representing San Antonio in 1993, among them a Fiesta poster, an autographed Spurs basketball, and letters and drawings from East Side school children. A local artist designed the time capsule. In 25 years, we'll all be turning 40, I think. Uh -huh. <laughs> hope you enjoyed this special preview of the Alamo Dome, and more than that, I hope that you can come down here in person and see it tomorrow. When San Antonio taxpayers agreed to build the Alamo Dome, it was with the hope and expectation it would draw some of the biggest sporting events in the world. Today, those dreams came true when it was announced that San Antonio would be the host of the 1998 Final Four in college basketball. Well, it's everything I expected as I walked up right now this uh, entranceway and uh, looked up to see the scale of it. It's, a, it's just a beautiful thing to see completed. I, I think uh, the city is going to use it for many, many years. The Dome was about assuring San Antonio's place as a competitor for professional sports because that's an element in America of how you recognize a city. Its scale, its prosperity, uh, its significance on the national scene. The 1999 NBA Finals. Tonight, Game 2, the New York Knicks versus the San Antonio Spurs. Another crowd in the vicinity of 40,000 has gathered at the Alamo Dome in San Antonio, knowing this might be the last time they'll see their beloved Spurs this year. In each of their first three playoff victories, they closed their opponent out on the road. That dome uh, has also was home to the Spurs' first championship, and then to the Alamo Bowl. Tonight in the Alamo City of San Antonio, it's out with the old year and in with the new at the state-of-the-art Alamo Dome. And tonight, the city of San Antonio plays host to a bowl game for the first time since 1947. It's the first Builders Square Alamo Bowl. A crowd of more than 50,000 is expected to watch California take on Iowa. And then to UTSA's Division I program, and to, to numerous Final Fours. We are deep in the heart of Texas where everything is big, including the dreams. And tonight, under the roof of San Antonio's Alamo Dome, either Utah or Kentucky will realize college basketball's biggest dream, the national championship. Here inside the dome, the colors are Utah red and Kentucky blue, accompanied by the sounds of college basketball, the brass and drums, the cheers and fight songs, an electric atmosphere filled with anticipation. So I think it was, um, 
It, it has accomplished its purpose in every respect but one, and that is we don't have an NFL team. The marching bands, the floats, the pageantry. Ten days every April, the city of San Antonio turns out for a huge party called... Fiesta! Fiesta San Antonio! Oh my goodness! Well, I mean, think about this. What other city that you all know of really truly celebrates diversity and culture the way we do right here in the heart of San Antonio? And it all started with the Battle of Flowers Parade. In 1891, a group of citizens got together and decided to honor both the heroes of the Alamo and the Battle of San Jacinto. In the early days of the parade, there were horse-drawn carriages and buggies decorated with flowers. The celebration was such a success that it became an annual tradition, paving the way for our fiesta celebration. Two full weeks, about 10 days, full of culture, and we honor the differences. We honor the beautiful diversity that makes this city what it is. Today, the Battle of Flowers Parade is one of the biggest events during Fiesta. More than 300,000 people line the streets of downtown San Antonio to watch marching bands, floats, and Fiesta royalty wind their way through downtown. Fiesta San Antonio, oh my goodness, I have been a part of the Fiesta Parade for years now. More than two. I have always said it's an incredible city where um, a jazz art, a classic jazz artist like me can be right alongside um, a conjunto player, a tejano player, um, a classical, um, a member of a classical orchestra like the San Antonio Symphony, um, you know, a German umpa band, grand choruses, barbershop, country and western, rock and roll. It's unbelievable. I have friends in all those genres. We compare notes, we enjoy each other, we try to encourage each other. San Antonio's music base has always been diverse, but I think that I have seen um, a kind of an explosion in that diversity. No me queda más que perderme en un abismo de tristeza y lágrima. Selena was a phenom. I had the good fortune of meeting her many years ago. Selena came to help us open the Hard Rock Cafe on the San Antonio River Walk in 1995. So I got to meet her, I got to see her perform. She had an audience in the palm of her hand. She was an incredible talent. She was a very petite woman, a very small person with this unbelievable magnetism. Her legend has grown even bigger. It's, it's almost beyond belief now in South Texas. In just five months, Pope John Paul will begin his visit to the United States. The Pope will travel to nine cities, beginning with Miami and ending in Detroit. The fourth city on the tour will be San Antonio. One day I walk into my office and my secretary says to me, Marty, there are two priests and a nun who want to talk to you, but they don't have an appointment. I said, well, put them in the conference room and let me talk to them. And they said, uh, Marty, we're in trouble. We've spent months trying to find a place for the papal mass and uh, we've run into every trouble in the world. Archbishop just called us in and said, if you don't find a place for the papal mass in one week, we're going to move it to Houston. And I, and I said, you can't do that. So I showed them five spots in Westover Hills. SeaWorld was under construction. The freeway was going to start construction. So I showed them five spots. And they said, well, the Pope is the head of state, so he has to be protected by the Secret Service, so they have to sign off on any site. So I said, well, show them the five sites. So the next day they came back and said, well, we want this one. And because I'm able to tell you that we have a site in fact, I want to repeat this. We have a site for the Holy Father's Mass. So 24 hours later, we had a lease, and I'll never forget, we were in the archdiocese. And the, 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 we have this big table, and it kind of looked like the Last Supper. I'm sitting next to the archbishop, and I have these nuns and priests around, and lawyers, and we're, we're signing the lease. And From the first announcement that the Pope would include San Antonio in his second visit to the U.S., to the countless man hours that have gone into getting the city ready to play host to the Pope, and then to the stunning destruction two days ago 
that wrecked the majestic mass site that had been built as a tribute to the Pope and his message of unity in the work of service. This has been a time in San Antonio probably like no other the city has seen before or perhaps will see again. The papal mass site is being readied and fast. The land has been cleared and grass will be planted this week. In this half hour, we will take you all around the city as San Antonio makes its final preparations for the Pope's arrival in just 15 hours. I guess I don't have time to be nervous right now. I just uh, feel like uh, I feel very good about where everybody is right now. I feel very, uh, let's say, cautiously optimistic that it's going to turn out okay. I was involved in the 1987 visit of Pope John Paul II to San Antonio. It was a, an amazing affair. Um, my job was to prepare the site for a mass, um, and we had 350,000 people uh, attend that mass. There he is, Pope John Paul II. Oh my goodness, we have seen it so many times, so many other cities, so many other parts of the world, and he is in San Antonio. But we've never seen it or heard it with mariachi music before. <laughs> A special touch from San Antonio to Pope John Paul II. This is the motorcade as it makes its way, by the way, to Westover Hills. Sorry to interrupt you there, Father, but I thought since we had this uh, live transmission from Sky 12, I would indicate what it is. Uh, it's hard to tell exactly where he is. I, I, I think that is probably Highway 90, but I, I may be wrong about that. Well. Uh, it's kind of difficult to tell from that. It looks like it might be Highway 151, which would put him fairly close to the mass site now. There is the Pope in the Pope Mobile, making his way through the crowd. You can hear the applause. They've already started. Some people are screaming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The whole day, was, he was here almost 24 hours really ended up being a wonderful uplift for all the community of San Antonio, not just the Catholic community, because so many other people got involved in it. I know the Pope, when he was a cardinal and a bishop, had traveled several times to the United States, but I have not read whether he's ever seen in person the Alamo before. It would be my guess this is the first time he has seen the Alamo. Now, the Pope Mobile has slowed down considerably right there in front of the Alamo. Your Holiness, John Paul II, I am pleased to welcome you to San Fernando Cathedral, the oldest parish church in San Antonio and the oldest cathedral sanctuary in the United States of America. As we forgive those who trespass against us, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. The Lord be with you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Obviously, that was a big deal for Santa. It made all the news. They had helicopters flying over the sites. It was a wonderful moment where the city could show that it could do something on the, at the world level, you know, um, a world-class kind of level to host uh, someone like the Pope and all the uh, entourage that comes with the Pope and all the media and all the coverage and all those kinds of things. And, sit, and, and, and the city did a great job. From the moment he stepped foot in San Antonio, the citizens embraced Archbishop Patrick Flores. Archbishop Patrick Flores ordained a priest in 1956, serving in Galveston and Houston. He was ordained as Auxiliary Bishop of San Antonio 14 years later. In 1978, he was appointed Bishop of El Paso. Then, just one year later, he became the Archbishop of San Antonio. In June 2000, quite a scare for the Archbishop. An El Salvadoran man, Nelson Escolero, held him hostage for nine hours. He was released and forgave Escolero. I'm just hoping and praying that um, whatever sentence he get, that somehow that it would be mixed in with uh, medical and psychiatric treatment. He became kind of like um, a symbol of the Mexican-American and the emergence of the Mexican-American and the civil rights issues surrounding the Mexican-American or the Hispanic-American. 
And, uh, and so throughout his life, there was different things that, that he was involved in that, that maybe most bishops were not involved in. Um, the incident here in San Antonio when he was taken hostage was a man who obviously was, was mentally um, distressed and was not on his medications, according to the family later on, told us um, he had a immigration issue that he wanted uh, help with and he wasn't getting any help from the normal sources. So he came to Archbishop Flores. He pretended to have a, a live hand grenade and said he was going to blow up uh, the office and the Archbishop with him if he didn't get help. And so Archbishop was held hostage for most of a day. And, um, and thanks be to God, everything turned out OK. And Archbishop Flores was fine after um, initially being taken to the hospital. And, and, and he uh, ended up coming through it. Typically, for him, it was no big deal, but for the rest of the community, it was a big deal. We're here in San Antonio, Texas, where they're serving up some righteous Mexican food. This is Taco Taco. Pica Papi Taco. It's a staple in San Antonio. A Puffy Taco is a taco on steroids. It's fluffy, puffy, and you can't get enough. -y. My dad had uh, bought a motor scooter. He had left the Coca-Cola company. He was driving a truck there. We started selling eggs door to door, and uh, we eventually opened a poultry house. We dressed chickens in our garage, then opened a poultry house, and we sold fresh dressed poultry and eggs, and we opened a fried chicken place. First location was 4119 Clark Avenue on the southeast side of San Antonio, and we were the first people to sell food to go in San Antonio, and we advertised five minute service. And my mother and dad's philosophy was to sell a product that everybody could afford, good quality food at a reasonable price with fast service. And uh, I mean, San Antonio has flocked to it over the years. But where is Texas' best Mexican food? Who has the tastiest tacos, the baddest burritos, the most edible enchiladas? We asked you to tell us, and you did just that. And coming in at numero uno is Mi Tierra in San Antonio's historic Market Square. What better place to find Mexican food than at the largest Mexican market in the U.S.? Okay, sure, maybe Mexico, but if you don't want to go all that way, then Mi Tierra is your best bet. The Cortez family still owns and operates this massive 500-seat restaurant, which began life as a tiny cafe in 1941. Since then, they've added a bakery, a bar, live music, and hundreds of seats. It's a San Antonio institution that stays open round the clock and it's a true Texas best. I'm in San Antonio, Texas. Home of the Alamo. About to take my stand against Chunky Spicy Four Horsemen Burger. Let's do it! The Dallas Chaparrales may have taken a trek, which will become more historical for San Antonio than the first cattle drive along the old Chisholm Trail. I realized that we had a job on our hands because given, given a choice, we would have come with a team that had identification. We would have come with a team that already was competitive. So we had to start from scratch. First get into the league, then put together a team, and recognize here that we really didn't have any uh, basketball fans in San Antonio at the time. Here comes Norman, the Iceman, driving at the left-handed. Oh, sensational shot by Gurley. His trademark was the finger roll. Because how could nobody block it. You know, you just roll it over their fingertips, you know, and they think they got it and it just roll over. The Iceman would be flipping things up, uh, finger rolls from, from the corner, <laughs> behind the basket, swish. The Spurs were a one-track team in a track meet league. So we had to create fans in San Antonio. And then we created that to such a degree that the teams didn't like to come in and play here because uh, uh, they were going to they were going to get a lot of resin uh, <laughs> if they were playing here. We had Billy Paltz, we had Mark Oberding, Kobe Dietrich, and then the Iceman. And George Gervin was under contract to Virginia Squires, but Angelo Angelo Drosis, Red McCombs, and John Schaefer were the three guys who were instrumental in. They leased the Spurs. They, they leased the team from Dallas. They didn't buy it. They leased it for a dollar, and then they negotiated the, the lease price for the, I think, turned out to be maybe 50000 or something, I don't know. Played in the old Hemisphere Arena. 
uh, and uh, that was in 1973. And uh, the NBA said it seated, it had a capacity of 10,008. They said, you have to go to 16,000 before we could continue your contract in the NBA. So they voted to raise the roof to put in 6,000 more seats. They didn't realize that they're going to have to put in pillars to hold the roof up because it wouldn't, it couldn't have done it without it. So they had 250 obscured vision seats in the old Hemisphere Arena, but it was still a great place to play. From the Hemisphere Arena in San Antonio, Texas, the New Orleans Jazz are fighting for their first NBA playoff berth. San Antonio Spurs are shooting lights out here in the game, 62%. Philadelphia hitting 52.1. They are always ready for action here in San Antonio. Welcome back to the Hemisphere Arena, everyone. Here are the starting lineups for this afternoon's game. The 1991 NBA playoffs. Today, it's the Golden State Warriors versus the San Antonio Spurs. It has been a week of celebration here in San Antonio, Texas, with Fiesta 1991 taking place in the River City. And San Antonio Spurs fans have been celebrating the victory by the home club in game one of their best of five playoff series on Thursday night. Beautiful 46 degree day in San Antonio and indoors. Better than 16,000 have turned out for the Spurs and the ball. San Antonio Spurs basketball on HSE. Live from Hemisphere Arena, Home Sports Entertainment presents San Antonio Spurs basketball. The San Antonio Spurs will pick first in the 1987 NBA Draft. The San Antonio Spurs select David Robinson from Navy. When I stepped out and realized that we had a chance with three great players the year that we got the Admiral, uh, and I got Larry Brown to come in as a head coach. It's time for sports with Red Simmons. Rick Holmes is now the new majority owner of the Spurs. Today, the reins of power will pass from the For the first time, San Antonio will have an owner who has a majority interest in the Spurs. We are committed that this franchise in San Antonio will be the very best that there is in the NBA. easy to get the fans into it uh, and more than once I had got called down from the league saying you got to calm that crowd down uh, oh yes right out we should, we'll take care of that right away no come on get it up a notch suit up San Antonio for the new Spurs season and a new beginning I'm Bob Salter and this is Deborah Daniels suit up San Antonio Suit up and signed up for first season tickets. Come on, San Antonio, suit up and sign up. Call now for first season tickets. 224-4611. Get your season tickets and join our team. It was a typical Spurs year, you know, win in the regular season, losing the playoffs. Everything that that uh, can be said was said. People were just searching for answers. For San Antonio, there has to be the ultimate letdown again. This is a team that has really underachieved when it's gotten the postseason. It was always David's fault or David didn't compete or David was soft. In reality, you know, all it meant was that the team wasn't good enough. The first pick in the 1997 NBA Draft goes to the San Antonio Spurs. Congratulations. With the first pick in the 1997 NBA Draft, the San Antonio Spurs select Tim Duncan from Wake Forest University. I love the San Antonio Spurs, by the way. If you're betting in the NBA this year, I think they're going to win it all. The 1999 NBA Finals. Game five, the San Antonio Spurs versus the New York Knicks. In 
New York, they still believe, but no team has ever come back from a 3-1 deficit to win the finals. No team has ever won games six and seven of the finals on the road. On the other hand, David Robinson and the Spurs have closed out their three previous playoff series away from home. And odds are they'll do it again tonight if Tim Duncan scores 28 points and pulls in 18 rebounds as he did in game four. Stunned. I didn't know. I, I, and I, when I reference we, I, I, I mean the Spurs and mean the city, but I didn't know we were going to win. I thought we were going to beat the Knicks eventually, but I didn't know we were going to win game five because it was a tight game, if you remember. So my biggest surprise was, you know, first of all, we're in the championship. We're in Madison Square Garden. You couldn't get in a more storied arena than Madison Square Garden for the first attempt at a championship. Well, not the first attempt, but at least the first real shot I thought we had at it. 79 was the other year I thought we were going to win it and just unfortunately didn't. But this year I thought we were going to win it. And then all of a sudden, I remember we're down and I'm walking down from where they had us in the press area. So I can't see the game for a few minutes, just assuming we're still losing. When I walk in to the floor, I see Avery put up the shot and goes in. As soon as I see that, I look up at the scoreboard and go, we're winning, we're winning. Oh my, we're and then I saw Latrell Sprewell go down to shoot the ball and he misses. I go, no, we won just won a championship. I remember darting out onto the court with the photographer and I'm just, I'm giddy and I'm just interviewing anybody who'll stand in front of me. You know, I don't care if it's everybody, David, Avery, I'm just throwing a mic at everybody's face. I'll never forget that. It was, it was a moment to, I can still remember standing there with Avery after everything's calmed down and we're doing a live shot and they tell me in my ear that people have parked their cars on 281 and gotten out, that the entire city is just shut down, no one's driving, they're all just getting out and cheering. And I said, they're doing what? And he says, no, the, there is a parking lot on 281. They've all stopped their cars, they're getting out and cheering. So I tell Avery, you're not gonna believe this, but 281 is a parking lot, they're getting out and cheering you guys. And he goes, oh, this is crazy. I go, I know, this is nuts, but this is great. Loved it, every second of it. When you talk Major League Sports in San Antonio, you talk Spurs. Joe Fowler is here to tell us the future looks bright for baseball, football, and other sports in our city. Brighter than most people think, Gene, I'm telling you. You know, we've been caught up in this minor league syndrome for years now. Too many people have been telling us that we haven't got a chance of getting a, a baseball team, an NFL football team, pro soccer. They are wrong. There are two men in this city who appear ready to change this. Mayor Henry Cisneros and Sigmore Corporation President Tom Turner Sr. Mayor Henry Cisneros visited with baseball commissioner Bowie Kuhn and NFL executive director Don Weiss. He wanted them to know that San Antonio is interested in major league sports. A local sports writer downplayed the trip, said it would be 15, 20, 25 years before we'd get a stadium. And he wrote, not only is a stadium off in Never Never Land, but San Antonio cannot support a Major League Baseball franchise that calls for 80 home games. Nothing ever develops when people make fun of those who try. But if we were able to work up something along the lines of some kind of stadium facilities, and that if we were able to work out whatever differences, and so far I'm just speculating that they exist between Houston and Dallas and ourselves, that we probably could have major league sports in this town in t within 10 years. Within 10 years. That's my assessment of it. With a lot of hard work, it's, it's, it's very possible. If we think small, we're going to be a minor league town into the 1990s, no doubt about it. This is the Bay Area's news station. Quan 4 News continues now. Tonight, Quan 4 can confirm a delegation from San Antonio will be in the Bay Area tomorrow to talk to Raiders brass about taking the team to Texas. New at 6 before the Raiders play their first game in Las Vegas, they might spend a couple of seasons in San Antonio, Texas. Raiders owner Mark Davis has said he wants to stay in Oakland until the stadium is ready here, but some Oakland City officials have said they want the Raiders gone. NFL insider Jason Lockenfora says the Alamo Dome is a possible temporary venue for the Raiders. The New Orleans Saints played here after Katrina with a thought that they might relocate. Uh, never, never, never occurred because the league committed to a, a wounded city, New Orleans. And then the Oakland Raiders were, were out there, but they got a better deal from Las Vegas for a newer stadium. So it may be, it may be that we're just doomed not to be an NFL city with the Dallas Cowboys claiming this region as theirs. Got really close, and I know Tom Benson seriously considered it. 
and sold out, what, three games in the Dome. So um, I think to get another shot, though, we're going to have to do something a little bit more dramatic. I think eventually it's going to happen. I think this state is big enough to bring out house three. But the problem is there's so many Cowboy fans here. Jerry does not want it to happen. When you put an NFL team here, it's not just San Antonio is going to show up. It's Corpus. It's Laredo. It's Austin. It's all of those cities are going to show up here and participate. But it really does help a city grow. And if I was in any position, I would really work towards making that uh, growth continue outside of just the Spurs. Homes by Ray Ellison. Come see for yourself. Well, Ray Ellison was quite a builder. He had he had the highest share of new homes in in the market in any city in America, with 65 percent of the homes in San Antonio being built by Ray Ellison, and he became a nationally important figure and helped create uh, the the company that is KB Home today by eventually selling Ellison into KB and they adopting his techniques. This is a case where the acquirer changed itself because of the lessons it learned from the acquired company. And of course, Ray Ellison left quite a legacy. Places like Valley High, for example, and the near north side made it possible for a lot of San Antonians to get a home that could never have because of the efficiency of his techniques and the pricing. I hope, I, you know, no one can really, no one has a crystal ball, I would hope that San Antonio, 50 years from now, would be similar to what it is now. I would, I would hate to see it overgrow and overdevelop and lose its heart. Majestic on Broadway, we have theater, we have art. I think it will just continue to grow. I don't think that we'll stop having that small town feel. In the next 50 years, I hope that San Antonio continues to have the same festive, positive feel that it has now, the same cultural experience in food and music and where everybody still knows each other despite the millions of people that are here. I see the city uh, retaining its charm. I think they do a very good job of doing that, but also expanding into growth with Austin and becoming the new Dallas-Fort Worth and the largest uh, lived in and worked in area in the state. They're saying we are going to have a million more people in the next, um, I think, 20 or 30 years. That's a lot of people. Um, how San Antonio adjusts to that and how it takes care of all of its people is very important. And 50 years from now, we'll still have that awesome Bill Miller's tea. Oh, absolutely. Just had a big glass for lunch today. I'm going to tell you where, where I hope we will be. I hope that as things evolve and change, which is natural, that there are people who, that go far beyond me, that, that make sure that we keep our heart, just that beautiful heart that we have, and our spirit. I think Highway 46 out there at the Bernie, that's the next loop, you know? And who knows, maybe we'll swallow New Braunfels and San Marcos and um, maybe Austin. San Antonio is gonna look a lot like it does today but it still will be known first and almost now as uh, the home of the Spurs. The next 50 years are, could be challenging for San Antonio, but they're only gonna be challenging if we don't plan. Uh, the most important thing to any city is to plan and not be caught off guard. You know, I look at things, uh, for example, these, these, and I'll give an example. If you look at the intersection of 281 and 1604, we knew 25 years ago that was coming. And we kind of just looked at it and really didn't do anything. There's an expression, grow with grace. And I think that's what we would like to do, but just grow more slowly. You know, I think 50 years from now, when we're already flying back and forth to Mars, people would be coming from Mars to visit San Antonio <laughs> and saying, wow, what a friendly city this is. Will we live happily ever after? Well, if we work together, it's up to you. This is a, pl a meeting place. It's also a place where the gringos came this far and the Hispanics came up from the south here. And this San Antonio, more than any other city in Texas, was then the meeting place of those two cultures. I'm so thankful for the founders 
of San Antonio, the people that came here and worked, like my mother and dad. Uh, they broke trail for our company. I just had to follow the path. The people, the founders of San Antonio, they broke the trail. They put the city here. They built it on the river and on the on San Antonio, on San Pedro Springs. And I'd like to thank them and thank all the people of San Antonio for what they've done uh, for our company, for our family. And I hope that we'll be I hope we'll be able to return that favor many times in years to come. Feliz cumpleaños, San Antonio. Uh, may the next 300 years be filled with peace and prosperity and greater understanding and a community that still comes together uh, in spirit and body uh, and will always continue to have the sense of community, knowing that the welfare and the well-being of your neighbor uh, is your own welfare and well-being. I'm so excited that we are celebrating our 300th birthday. It is something for all of us to be so happy about and to be so proud of because we have such a wonderful, big-hearted city. May we celebrate not only our 300th year, but every day. Feliz cumpleaños, San Antonio. Thank you so much for giving me love for 13 years. We'll be seeing you just inside Loop 1604. When the Canary Islanders came and when Davy Crockett came to this area, they were struck with your beauty and your culture. And 300 years later, you have aged with grace and dignity. We are so proud and so grateful to be a part of San Antonio. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, San Antonio. Happy birthday. Happy tricentennial. So proud to be a part of this celebration here in my city. Happy birthday, San Antonio. You are one in a million. It's all here in the heart. Here's to 300 more years and beyond. San Antonio, happy birthday. Feliz cumpleaños. 300 years of bliss and 300 years of hospitality. Happy 300th birthday, San Antonio. This is going to be a great year. Happy birthday, San Antonio. It's been a long time coming, 300 years. Wow. Think about the first missionaries that just finally walked in, you know, and they saw this place. Little did they know what was going to become of it 300 years later. From a guy who was born and raised in this fair city, happy birthday, San Antonio. You're looking great at 300. Our tricentennial. Wow. We're getting older, but I think we're getting better. I think we continue as a city to learn and grow and appreciate each other. So happy birthday, San Antonio, and all of you who with me are privileged to live in this wonderful city. San Antonio, happy birthday. I love you like a family member. Uh, I feel about my city as intensely as I do about my own family, and I mean that very sincerely. I'm here, uh, signed on for the long run, uh, working at it every day, uh, forgiving the flaws, and trying to make the city better in every way that, that I can and we can. Uh, happy birthday, 300 years of rich history, and many, many, many more accomplishments ahead Thank you, San Antonio, for setting an example to America, a country I love, of, of how people can live together and how we're going to build the country together. San Antonio, an exemplar. From me to all of the people of San Antonio and to all who will visit us, happy birthday, 300 years. God bless. As a community, we are all standing before a mirror, gazing at our collective image. We know what we are, we're confident of that, certainly proud of it. How our face will change in the future is a painful unknown. All we know for sure is the next time we steal a glance, our look will be different, sometimes bearing the traumatic brand of great struggle and challenge. Other times the change will come without our ever even noticing, like a child growing to maturity a little bit each day. The reality that change will always be with us and the reality that we have the power to shape and mold that change. Look in the mirror and imagine the amazing change since that first airstrip was scraped out of the dust at Kelly. Now imagine the next 80 years of change is even more breathtaking. That is our job in the days and years ahead. That imagining is the first step to the becoming. 
So the next time we take a look at our reflection, we like what we see with a great pride in knowing the change has not only made us different, but better. San Antonio, it's really good to see you. It's been a while, but you've been on my mind. I've seen your rolling hills and winding rivers so clear that I could almost make them mine. I can almost see the old Bandera Highway stretching out toward old Mexico. And the times we used to walk down by the river, now it seems like such a long, long time ago. San Antonio, it's really good to see you. It's been a while, but you've been on. Sitting here and looking out the window Thinking just how good things used to be Well, I might be coming back to only memories Over San Antonio, you sure look good to me